This is going to be a very brief uh, uh, summary of some of the changes. As all of you are probably aware, DSM-5, the fifth revision uh, of the DSM, uh, was formally introduced, uh, released actually about a month ago, exactly a month ago uh, today in San Francisco, and is expected to be fully operational and utilized across the board uh, with effect from October of this year across different agencies. And I'm, I'm really going to touch upon the process of DSM-5, development of DSM-5, some uh, brief tidbits, if you will. Uh, I've had the privilege of being involved in the process. I'm a, I, I was a member of the DSM-5 work group uh, on psychotic disorders. Uh, important disclosures, uh, I, I, as a member of the DSM-5 process, uh, I have been, I have strong feelings about the process, and so that might color my presentation some. And I, I've been a practicing psychiatrist now for about 30 years, uh, and I've been doing clinical research for almost that period of time. And both those experiences bias the way I think about psychiatric disorders. And, and that might be reflected in the presentation. So briefly talk about the process of DSM-5. What are the major changes broadly uh, across the manual from DSM-4 to DSM-5? And then hone in uh, very briefly on the changes in the treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, specifically intellectual, uh, those that are relevant uh, to this particular meeting. Uh, what are the changes in the DSM treatment of intellectual disability? Uh, treatment of autism and uh, or, or other disorders related to autism, and briefly touch upon ADHD, specific learning disorders, etc. So this is the manual, this is the cover of the manual, uh, and there are many, many, there's a pocket version, there are the paperback version, a hard, hard, I mean, there are hard copies, a number of different versions. And this is, so one of the questions is, why did we need DSM-5? We have DSM-4. Uh, DSM-4 was uh, published in 1994, and do we really need a new manual? Uh, what is the purpose of developing uh, a new diagnostic manual? 20 years is a long time, and we've learned a lot over the last 20 years about different psychiatric disorders. So that was an important objective. Uh, introduce, incorporate the new information that we've garnered over the past 20 years uh, into a revised definition uh, uh, and criteria for different disorders. Those of you familiar with the DSM process know that the first DSM came, uh, was introduced in 1952, DSM-2 in 1968, and perhaps the most revolutionary change in DSM was the introduction of DSM-3 in 1980. And DS, one of the important things about DSM-3, two, two important things that I'd mention. One, operational criteria were introduced in DSM-3. Uh, that is, fixed definitions for different disorders. And the focus in DSM-3 was in reliability. DSM-1, DSM-2, broad definitions. This is what we think the disorder might be like and how we describe it. But both DSM-1 and DSM-2, different clinicians would diagnose different conditions based on the same presentation. They would not agree on, on, on a particular diagnosis. So reliability was not particularly good. DSM-3 changed that. Since DSM-3, the reliability of most psychiatric disorders has improved substantially. So DSM-3R, the revision, uh, 87, DSM-4 in 1994, and some of you think about DSM-4-TR, or DSM-4 text revision that came out in 2000, but it was merely a text revision. None of the criteria were changed from DSM-4 to DSM-4-TR. The focus in DSM-5, in contrast to the focus in DSM-3, DSM-3-R, DSM-4, is let's focus on validity. We've had We've got pretty, improved, uh, pr pretty good reliability now. Don't compromise that. Preserve that good reliability. Improve it when you can. But now let's look at the validity of psychiatric disorders. Let's really focus on 
is this condition, does it really define something meaningful seen in the population uh, at large? And does it define an entity which has a relatively coherent etiology, a relatively coherent neurobiology, pathophysiology, uh, a, a fairly clearly defined clinical presentation. So big emphasis on validity. We don't want to compromise reliability, improve it when you can, but this was not the focus. And very, very important, improve clinical utility. So if you think about your experience with DSM-4, uh, some, of the question, some of the problems that you probably encounter, one, Almost no one has one diagnosis. Almost everybody has three, four, five diagnoses, which does not mean that there are five distinct conditions that, are, uh, that represent the problems that this particular individual might be experiencing. Maybe there are one, maybe there are two, but the way we define these different disorders leads to a diagnosis of four or five different conditions. So one of the problems has been a significant artificial comorbidity. Now, an individual can have two dif distinct conditions, but diagnosing them should be based on this person really has two separate distinct conditions, which should be the focus of treatment, rather than have defining six or seven different conditions, just because that's the way the criteria line up. So this has been a significant problem with DSM-4. Another problem, a lot of not otherwise specified. Uh, I don't know uh, how much NOS is utilized in child psychiatry, but my assumption is about 30% of your diagnoses, if not more, are NOS. And I'm not sure what NOS really connotes. It's not a particularly useful term, and particularly when it's okay to say I don't quite have the amount of information I need to make a definitive diagnosis. But when NOS stays for a year, 10 years, that's a problem. I mean, you should be able to define uh, what the problem might be over a period of time as you get information. Now, I'm sure all of you, all experts in this room, know all the 57 conditions that are part of neurodevelopmental disorders. I'm sure you do. Uh, for that matter, I'm pretty certain you know, you can list, enumerate, the 165 separate disorders in DSM across the manual including the subtypes, there are 355. And you can all do that. But for most people in clinical practice, that is difficult. It's a very complicated system. I don't know how many disorders might be relevant here. Depression, for example, there are about 35 different conditions where depressive symptomatology can be diagnosed. And so how do you differentiate between them? An extremely complicated system. So the objectives really were A, address this really clinical utility. Most important, clinical utility, validity, and incorporate new information, and yes, try and improve reliability, or at least preserve it uh, if you can. And then there was uh, different challenges in different disorders that different groups had to address. So th those were the drivers for DSM-5, and we talked about some of the challenges with DSM-4. I mean, the purpose of DSM-5 incorporate new information, and address the problems posed by DSM-4. Another problem, distinctions between different disorders. I mean, I, in a, I, I specialize in psychotic disorders. Uh, where does schizophrenia end and schizoaffective disorder begin? Very difficult to define. Uh, where, do different, where are the boundaries between different disorders that you see in children, adolescents? The distinctions between different disorders are very fuzzy uh, f for many of, of these uh, boundary conditions. To what extent the diagnosis guide treatment selection? It should. In the rest of medicine, it does. Uh, in psychiatry, it does. But we can do a lot better. Researchers have found the, the, the diagnostic uh, criteria in DSM-4 to be hindering research progress because the boundaries between different conditions are, you know, are not very clear. And very importantly, reliability does not equal validity. Yes, reliability of psychiatric diagnoses have improved very substantially. But the focus has to be now on the reality 
of different disorders uh, focusing on validity. DSM-5 took a long time to develop. It was a 14-year birthing process for DSM-5. Uh, the process really began a few years after DSM-4 was published, before DSM-4 text revision uh, was published in 2000. It began with the development of a research agenda for DSM-5. What are the challenges? What are the problems? What information do we need? What are the knowledge gaps? Uh, what do we need to be studying so that we can develop a better diagnostic system? And then there were a series of 13 research workshops, planning uh, conferences on different sets of disorders, coordinated by the American Psychiatric Association, the World Health Organization, which is responsible for ICD, the other major classification system in medicine is the, uh, is the International Classification of Diseases. And right now, whereas the rest of the world is following ICD-10, we are still in the era of ICD-9, although ICD-10 was introduced in 1992. And the rest of the world has been implementing ICD-10 since 1993. Uh, we will only begin implementing ICD-10 in October of next year. So. Uh, that, but that's another story altogether. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and a number of ICD-11 experts, if you will. Then in 2006, the task for, uh, force was appointed. Uh, David Kupfer uh, was appointed as the chair of the task force. Daryl Regeer is the vice chair of the task force. And the 13 work groups with a total of 168 members was appointed in 2007. That's when I was appointed, uh, for example, to the Psychotic Disorders Work Group. And for f we worked for five years. And I'll share with you a little bit of what we did. What were the issues that we addressed? Starting off with, so what are the challenges with the disorders that are part, that are the purview of our particular section? What are the problems that clinicians face? What are the problems from an information perspective? What new information uh, ch uh, must prompt a change in the definition of different conditions? Uh, so an extensive literature review, extensive data reanalyses. We, look, we must have looked at at least 200 different big data sets, if you will, to, in our own work group to uh, address some of the challenges that we faced. Between 2010 to 2012, the field trials were conducted. In, two, in July of 2012, based on the field trials, based on the feedback uh, with many review groups, it was an extensive, A, if anyone suggests that DSM-5 was not adequately transparent, uh, they must be living in a different world. Because it was clearly, by far, the most transparent development of any kind, any psychiatric set of psychiatric uh, diagnosis criteria ever. Uh, at, at any point, for example, when there were certain ideas that were being discussed by the work group, they were on the website. There were 25,000 comments received by, the, uh, by, by different work groups uh, from the website. In, this is formal uh, correspondence, if you will. In addition to that, there were a number of informal uh, uh, ideas received uh, and, and comments, criticisms received from experts, others, if you will. The final draft, uh, 2012, went through the final review process, if you will, and there were five different committees. And I'm painfully aware of our interactions with each of these five different committees, uh, if you will, uh, which really reviewed these ideas that were submitted. And actually, there was a lot of back and forth between the work groups and each of these review committees with regards to uh, possible changes or absence of changes in DSM-5. And finally, in December, uh, the first week of December last year, the Board of Trustees approved uh, the DSM-5. And it was published uh, and released uh, in the third week of May in San Francisco. Uh, about a month ago.